focus this week is going to be driving the main spindle. The original drive on this machine was a 110 volt DC motor of about, I think, 250 or 350 watts, um, driven off a pulse width modulated speed controller. I burnt out the windings on the motors years ago by being a little ambitious with uh, trying to cut things too big for this machine. Years ago, I switched over to a three phase motor. But before we get to that, I'll quickly print up a wiring cap for the ZX drive motor. And there you can see that um, wiring cover just loosely mounted to the back of my motor. I still need to do the wiring in there so it's not on permanently yet. Next up, looking at the motor itself, it's nothing special, it's just a bog standard industrial three-phase motor. Can be connected either with for delta or star, so either um, 400 volts or 240 volts. I've got it connected in delta for 240. It's a two-pole motor, so it turns at high speed. It'll be at about 2700 on the European 50 hertz. To drive it, I'm using this uh, variable frequency drive or inverter made by the company F4. Bought it years ago off, uh, off eBay. Uh, it's one horsepower. Once again, 240 volt uh, single phase input and I'm using the 240 volt three phase output. The motor mount will mount onto the table rather than directly to the lathe itself. As you can see, it was one of the first castings I ever did. It's not going to win any awards for, uh, for beauty or quality of casting, but gets the job done and does allow some adjustment for belt length here. This will give you a rough idea of the drive layout. I'm using a Poly-V four tooth belt between the motor and the lay shaft here. Uh, in, in the final installation, the motor will be rotated and be sitting behind the lathe over here. Poly-V belts have a 20 degree included angle. So I just ground up a, a cutting tool on the Clarkson, found the dimensions off the internet and plunged the tool in to make the grooves. This one still needs to get its keyway cut, so I think we'll do that next. I'm not actually sure where the key's got to. I did have one, but it looks like I've lost it. Probably have to make up a new key as well. To mount the slotting head, I have to move the table, the x axis over till this flap is cleared. So the vertical head just pulls forward off, off, off dowel pins and then swings around to the side. Where there's a latch to lock it. Once the head swung out it exposes the horizontal spindle which is also a um, number 40 taper and the drive for the vert vertical spindle or in this case the slotting head. Next we need to set up the slotting head. For this job I need a stroke of about 30 millimeters let's say plus 10 so about about 40 millimeters. The stroke is set through this plug hole. This is just a typical scotch yoke design as you find on any shaper or slotting head where you loosen off this 15mm bolt, adjust the eccentricity of the throw, set it to whatever stroke length you want. So once you've loosened the um, scotch yoke, there's a second plastic cover under here 
which has the actual uh, adjusting screw to adjust the stroke length. What I need to do is set the stroke down to bottom dead center because then there's a scale here where I can read off my stroke length. Oh, sh ah, okay. There are plugs on both ends, so I need to take up the top plug, my mistake. You can see how often I've used this, this shaping head, and in fact you can see how often anyone's ever used this shaping head because it's basically as new. I bought it from some guy in Tyrol about a year ago and it doesn't look like anyone's ever really used it. So I'll set it to about 45, which gives me about 7 millimeters either side of the peat part I'm cutting. Now I can re-tighten the scotch yoke. There's a setting scale on the side. You can see we've set a stroke length of 45 millimeters or 1.8 inches. So we're limited to a maximum of 125 RPM, which will give us 180 strokes a minute. The slotting head's not super heavy, but it's heavy enough that it's not good for your back to lift it on, especially leaning in over the, uh, the catch tray here. So I like to put a couple of bits of wood down on the table and let the table lift it up. Another thing which can help when trying to align these uh, drive accessories is to put the gearbox into neutral. Because now you can easily rotate this. I'll put it in, in a vertical position, which probably makes it easiest to line up. Next up, before I use it, I'll lubricate it. On machine tools, grease nipples are normally not for grease. These are for whey oil. This is a 220 weight whey oil I'm using here. I'm not quite sure if it's the correct one for this machine. The, the uh, instruction manual says 220 whey oil, but the, there's a sticker on the side that says it should be using 68 weight whey oil. Because I use the machine so infrequently, I've kind of convinced myself that it's probably for the best using the heavier whey oil. That'll stay on the ways longer and not drip off or, or sag off with gravity. So I'll give it a command of S125, which is 125 RPM, and M3, start the spindle clockwise. Change the gear. That's looking good. I'm not sure how people normally touch off a, a slotting tool. But I've got a 9.5 millimeter shaft here and a 14 millimeter hole. I'll move the shaft into so it's just touching this edge of the hole, zero it, and then move over another two and a half millimeters, and then the shaft should be running on center line. I need to cut a five millimeter 
slot or keyway. So I'm going to need to, to do one plunge pass out one millimeter to the left of the center line and one to the right of the center line to get a five millimeter slot off a three millimeter tool. If there's better ways to touch off and find center of this kind of tool, I'd like to hear it. Please put something in the comment section. I'd appreciate it. What a complete idiot. This was supposed to be the retract move to pull it back up out of the hole. So that should have been a Z move. Typ typical brain fade, high speed, in the wrong axis, bam, crashed, probably wrecked the pad. So what are the consequences of that short little flight into idiocy? Well, I've permanently marked this part with the shorthand version of uh, Ave's uh, warning. It still should work though. The, the rest of the bore seems to be in, in reasonable condition. The second thing is I bent my boring bar. It's not much, but got a bit of a bent in it now. And I'm not sure if you can see it, but the, the third thing is I've marked the back of the chuck back plate. You can hardly feel it though. It's more of a polish mark. Before I use the uh, mahu again, I'm going to need to retram the bed because it's probably been pushed out of alignment. He's maybe a little bit loose, but there's no great amount of power on there. Last thing I need to make is a hubcap just to retain that pulley axially. Last week, I got quite a lot of feedback and discussion on the Dual's gearbox, so I thought I'd better go into this in a little more detail. The setup is basically just like this. You have an input shaft which drives this, uh, this lay shaft and back up here to an output gear. Now the dog clutch here either engages or disengages that, that output gear. So either you're going to be driving straight through with a with one to one ratio, or you drop down, go across, come back up for about a five or six to one ratio gear reduction. So what's actually wrong with it? There's the obvious damage to the tooth here, but let's talk a little bit more about why it was caused. That interstage bearing is supposed to be lubricated, but obviously wasn't terribly well. Um, it's also definitely been re replaced before. You end up with a bushing which is completely slogged out, but slogged out on both inner and the outer race. That moved enough that one of the two woodruff keys stuck between these two gears, causing the damage. So what actually needs to be done on this gearbox? On the one hand, I need to replace this. So I've already got a slug of oil light bushing to replace that. However, this shaft is also heavily worn. It's been welded up at least once before. It's got a damaged woodruff key slot and is massively oversized. 
So this is just a simple turning and milling job. So I would just replace this and make a new, a new output shaft. The second thing that needs to be done is the, the inner shaft bearing here needs to be ground back smooth because it's got very heavy wear on it. This doesn't need to be any specific size because I'll be making a matching bushing for it anyway. I'm not looking at softening it, turning it and then re-hardening it. I'm more likely just to grind this straight to its final dimension. Just grind it until it cleans up and use whichever diameter I can get. Yes, I could uh, anneal this part, build it up with some either braise or, or a TIG weld repair and then file it down. But I'm really not confident that I can recreate the tool profile of a, of a helical gear tooth accurately enough that it will actually carry any real load. Either it's going to have high spots, which are going to cause problems, or it's going to have low spots, which just don't carry a load. I've got a third of a tooth there to carry loads. I'm pretty sure that Dual only made one two-speed gearbox and fitted it to all of their various different machines. This is the 16 inch, it's probably the smallest um, bandsaw they made. They also fitted that gearbox to much, much larger machines. So I'm once again quite confident that I can just keep using this gear as it is without even repairing it. The problem I have is not the gear. The problem is getting this surface ground concentric to these two. And that's where I first need to set it up and, and get these, these centers um, accurate again. Well, I think it's time I start cutting this video, so as always, thanks a lot for watching, and if you like what you see, please recommend it to one of your friends.